One of the earliest and most enduring symbols of the Christian church is that of a small wooden boat sailing on the stormy seas. You can find images of boats displayed in stained glass windows in many modern churches, and carved in sculptures from the Renaissance era, even sketched in iconography from the days of the early church. Over the centuries, the church adopted the spiritual symbolism of the boat to establish itself as the essential vessel of salvation in the world. In a dangerous, turbulent, unpredictable world in which evil always seems to lurk just beneath the surface, the boat, that is the church, was believed to be our only refuge. But for many moderns, that boat is stuck in the mounting whirlpool of hypocrisy, archaic thinking, judgmentalism, certitude, dogmatism, scandal, silence, complicity, and anti-science. For them, the boat is taking on water if it hasn't already capsized. In that boat, there's just not enough room for questions and not enough room for a God who is so much bigger than our doctrines. In that boat, there are so many voices saying shh that it's hard to hear the psst of God. Have you ever heard the psst of God? In chapter two of Life After God, we meet this God who from the beginning of time and space as we know it, has always been calling and coaxing and wooing and beckoning creation toward the divine dream of wholeness and shalom, well-being for all things. This God will not, does not, cannot force anything or anyone to do anything at any time. And because the nature, the essence of this God is never to coerce, but always to persuade us toward becoming, to say yes to the divine psst that is spoken everywhere. That psst is saying, you can do this, and you can become this. God lures and we respond, and we pursue, and we become more than we are. It's been this way for 14 billion years. This collaborative, co-creating relationship. It's how we got here, it's how we remain here, and it's how we live and move and have our being while we still are here. Most of us have been taught to believe in an all-powerful, omnipotent God who's in charge of everything and everyone, who coerces and controls us unilaterally, who makes things happen according to God's will so that every event we experience fulfills some divinely predetermined future for our lives. But this all-powerful God does not exist in the Bible. This all-controlling God is not a rational construct. This omnipotent God is not consistent with our lived experience. If you've grown so weary of or disillusioned by such a God that you're now living life after God altogether, maybe there's a God in the Bible you've never met. A God who loves us too much to coerce or control us. A God who lures, beckons, persuades, and woos us toward the divine dream, calling us to becoming, to goodness, to beauty, and to the shalom of God.